Hey everybody, thanks for uh, coming today to the webinar, Understanding and the Upcoming Changes to New York DFS Cybersecurity Regulations. My name is Ryan Emmerich. I'm a client experience manager here at Kite Tech. Uh, Jason, who is joining us here, just popped his video on. Hey Jason, is our Hello. technology and solutions officer. He's gonna be going through some, some details on what the regulations look like and how we can respond to improve security and compliance here, which is awesome. Uh, we hope you kind of use this session to understand some of these rules a little bit more. For Kite Technology Group clients, you guys are probably familiar with some of the faces on this uh, on this webinar today. But for maybe those who have not worked with Kite Technology Group before, we are a managed IT service provider uh, specializing really in independent insurance agency as a big part of our vertical, but serving small and medium-sized businesses really across the U.S. at this point. Um, we, we work with nonprofits, accounting, some other industries as well. So if you have some professional services needs and you're not working with us today, we'd love to hear from you and get in touch to see how we can support your business. Um, Kite Technology Group has been around over 30 years now, crazy to say. Uh, and our goal is just, again, to help leverage technology to make sure your business is operating at its peak efficiency and security wise. Um, and we really have a staff that has backgrounds in making sure those things function well for your team. Uh, on the screen, you can kind of see a couple additional services we all offer between managed services, consulting services, IT um, solutions in various spaces. So please, after the webinar, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you uh, and see how we can add value to your team and company moving forward. With that, all being said, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Jason here, and we can take a look at some of the cybersecurity regulation pieces from uh, a DFS in New York. Jason, it's all yours. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Jason Goble from Kite Technology Group. Um, I brought my giant coffee cup with me today. Um, hopefully, won't need it, but we'll see. Um, so I've been with Kite Tech here for about a decade. I've been in um, IT, specifically insurance-focused, for just a little over 20 years. Um, I do have an Arizona property and casualty license, but I am a dyed-in-the-wool security engineer. Um, also happen to be a national regional conference presenter. Shameless plug, if you're going to be at NetView, if you're going to be at AppliedNet, stop by, say hi. So today, today we're going to talk about some of the timelines of changes of things that have happened in the regulations over the last few years. And we're going to talk specifically about the new and the updated definitions that New York is bringing to the table. Uh, we're going to revisit what it means to be limited exemption. Um, five years into the making, I still get a lot of questions on that. So we're going to hit that again. And we're going to review the key proposed changes. Um, we're not going line by line. We're not going by letter by letter. There's no way I could keep you awake for that. Um, but we are going to hit the key and the meaningful things. Um, number one, to see what New York is doing, but also to kind of get a glimpse in the future, because a lot of what they're doing um, coincides with other state regulations and things of that nature. Um, hopefully, if we can dive right through this, we're going to have ample time for questions. Um, like Ryan mentioned, uh, send the questions in along the way. If I can fit them into the presentation, I'll answer them in line. Worst case scenario, we'll hit them at the end. Um, if you do submit a question, I, I will answer the questions, even if we have to run a little bit long on time. Um, I'm happy to stick around, answer all the questions. Um, I love talking about this stuff. So before we get started talking about the changes to 23 NYCRR, uh, let's kind of revisit 23 NYCRR and and who it applies to. Because even, even today, I still get a lot of questions. Is, is this something I have to pay attention to? Um, so 23 NYCRR applies to covered entities. So the way to find out if you're a covered entity, um, any person or company um, operating under um, or requiring a license. So if you have a resident producer license in New York, if you have a non-resident producer license in New York, uh, this means you. So uh, pretty much all of us in some case, but even if that doesn't apply to you, 
I still hope you'll pay attention. There's a lot to learn here because what New York did when they started this regulation is they really set the tone. So this isn't a New York thing, some weird state in some strange corner doing some things. This is this is really good information across the board. So as you go through the si slides, um, they all have kind of the same look and feel. Um, they are word heavy. I apologize for that, but you know we are talking about regulation. So um, in the upper left, you'll see the section. That's that's the twenty three MYCRR sections. Um, the black ones apply to everybody. The gold apply to limited exempt to, to those who are not limited exempt. So or sorry, those who are limited exempt. So if you see the gold, I still want you to pay attention because even though New York listed as a limited exemption, um, your cyber liability carriers, your NAIC model law, um, your other states might have a different opinion. So pay attention. In blue, you'll have the section titles. And in the middle of the slide, you'll have the section language. So it's not the entire section and it's not word for word. What we tried to do is kind of distill it down, give you the new and notables, the interesting things, um, the things that have correlations with, with other aspects of insurance in other states uh, to really kind of get to the, to the nuts and the bolts and the, and the meat of this thing. So let's start with some ground rules. Rule number one, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a security guy. So this is not legal advice. You got legal questions, ask a lawyer. I'm not here to tell you what you can and cannot get away with. That's that's not what I do. <laughs> uh, rule number two, uh, compliance is a journey. It's not a destination. There's no finish line. Um, there are no boxes to check. You know, we we do this thing every day. Um, it's all about being secure. We wake up, we make material improvements, we go to sleep. We wake up, we make material improvements, we go to sleep. So this is a, a living, breathing, never-ending journey that we're on to be secure. Rest assured, somewhere in the dark corner of the internet, there's somebody right now thinking up new and exciting ways to ruin tomorrow. So we always want to be one step ahead of that guy. Uh, third one. You achieve compliance. I help. You know, companies like Kite Technology, we play, we play a major critical role. But at the end of the day, you need to decide if it's enough, enough to meet compliance, enough for your business. Uh, security is an awful lot like insurance. You know, do I have enough coverage? Well, what are you comfortable with? Because it's all a conversation of risk. You know, you never score a hundred but you certainly don't want to score a zero. Um, so at the end of the day, um, it's you guys that are signing off on this. It's you guys that are going to New York and saying, yes, we, we did all the things you asked. We did it to the best of our ability. So today's goal, again, we're going to hit the key points, the key points in the considerations in the proposed changes. And we're going to try and get a laser focus on the things that matter. So not so much when they're talking about, you know, wordsmithing, although we will point out some clarifications here and there. All right. So let's uh, let's get it going. Let's start with a, just a brief journey back in time. So back in 2017, New York created what they called first of its kind regulation. Uh, it's 23 MYCRR. So it was, in fact, first of its kind, um, not so much because of the cybersecurity requirements, but it actually had a reporting and enforcement mechanism. You would have to go to the New York um, DFS portal. You would have to swear on a stack of Bibles that you did all the stuff. So they were really keen on knowing who was compliant, who was not compliant, where everybody was in that journey. That's really what made it first of its kind. So around that same time, NAIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, they saw New York doing its thing and they did the math and they're like, oh, we're going to have every state going to have a different regulation. So they got together and they formed what they called the data security model law. So 
a very, very similar to what New York did, but it was a, it was a cybersecurity playbook, a series of guidelines, and they started shopping this around to the various states trying to get buy-in. So by 2019, uh, 23 MRCR had gone into full effect. Um, in the initial version, there were some um, some deferments. You know, you you didn't have to do certain things right away. But by 2019, we were full steam ahead. So 2020, uh, Chubb gets hit with May's ransomware. 2021, uh, CNA pays out 40 million dollars in a ransomware attack. And cyber liability carriers really started to significantly revise their applications. So even just a couple of years ago, it was pretty obvious that that what we were doing wasn't working. It didn't solve the problem. It might have made it a little better, but there was still a lot more ahead of us to go. So by 2022, now we're talking five years later, 21 states have passed laws based on the NAIC model law. And now New York is making proposed changes to 23MYCRR. Um, they open it up for public comment. Public comment's now closed. So now they're going to decide what comes next. Um, just taking a look at the regulations and what they're proposing, a lot of it makes a lot of sense. So I suspect that what we're covering today, although it is theoretical because it hasn't passed, um, I, think, I think this is a pretty good predictor of what the future looks like. So I'm going to stay awake here. And we're going to get into some new and revised definitions. So section one of NAIC, of, of 23 MYCRR are the definitions. And most of it remains unchanged, but there is some new and interesting language, starting with what they call a class A company. So a class A company gets referenced in, in some of the proposed changes a couple of times. The class A companies, those are the Chubs and the CNAs of the world, over 2,000 employees, over a billion in gross annual revenue. It's probably not us today, uh, but it is interesting to see that that's what they're focused on. I mean, they're really trying to um, you know, take an industry-wide problem and, and, and make a good, good approach for it. So class A companies are a new thing. Um, there's new language around what it means to have an independent audit. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting uh, slight glimpse into the future because you start to see this happen in other regulations as well. You know, independent audits are performed by external people that are not beholden to your company. They're not your IT team. Um, they're nobody that you pay. These guys, they don't have a dog in the fight. So if you get a failing grade, you get a failing grade. You get a passing grade, you get a passing grade. Um, you know, here at Kite Tech, we have a security trust mark certification. And, and it goes through a similar process. An auditor shows up, looks at the policies, looks at the procedures, asks for proof, and ultimately decides, did we, did we pass or did we fail? Um, we can't influence that decision at all, short of having good policies and procedures. So that's what the independent audit looks like. You're going to see this language pop up in the future in, in many places. Another new definition is a privileged account. So a privileged account, by definition, is any account that can perform functions, especially security-related functions, that ordinary users cannot. So um, if you can change security on your computer, you're a privileged account. If you can install and uninstall applications, you are considered a privileged account. So that's important to know because that language comes up later on as well. Uh, just general rule of thumb, a privileged account is not something you wanna be when you grow up. A lot of scrutiny around privileged accounts a lot of scrutiny around their actions um, on systems and how they have to be monitored differently. So minor revision in the risk assessment process, uh, but it's an interesting one. So they clarified a risk assessment. The risk assessment must take into account specific circumstances of the covered entity. 
So what that means is the risk assessment has to be personal. It has to be about you and your business. Um, you can't just grab a boilerplate template, check some boxes and call it done. The risk assessment really has to take into account your size, your staffing, your situation. Are, is everybody working from an office or multiple offices from home? What does that look like? Um, so what the risk assessment means um, and how it gets done is going to be pretty important for the future. Another definition they added, senior governing body. Um, in the old language, a lot of times they would point to um, an individual or cybersecurity staff. Sometimes they called that a chief information security officer, sometimes a chief information security coordinator. Um, so this language is really about driving the concept home that this is not one person's job. Everybody has to understand. Everybody's got a role to play. And ultimately, this is a pass-fail based on the senior governing body. Um, collectively, the senior governing body, that's going to be your, your executive leadership team. It's going to be your board of directors. It's going to be your team leads. Um, those are the people that are ultimately going to have to put their heads together and say, yes, we've done a good job here. Yes, we meet compliance. Let's sign off on this thing. So you're going to see that language uh, more and more as well. So here's a definition I wanted to bring up because we had a question um, when we when we initially announced this webinar. We asked for you know questions and stuff, and uh, somebody asked an excellent question: What does material mean? Because we use that word a lot, material changes, material events, stuff like that. It's an excellent question. The word material is used 11 times in the 23 MICRR regulation. It's not defined once. So uh, I guess we go back to Webster's definitions. Um, we go back to the legal definition of material, um, something that is significant, important, major, consequential, and relevant. I think the bottom line is, if it's important enough to, for you to ask whether or not it's material, it probably is material. So keep that in mind. So let's revisit limited exemption for a moment and what it means to be limited exemption. Um, this word choice created a lot of confusion. Um, and I don't know that they did a they really cleared it up, but hopefully I'm going to hit that right now today. So limited exemption never meant exempt. There were just a handful of things that didn't apply to you in 23 MYCRR, but the vast majority still did. Still had to have a program. You still had to have policies. You still had to perform that risk assessment. Um, so there was a lot that you still had to do. That concept of a limited exemption does still exist. Now, they have made some minor changes to it or are proposing some minor changes, I should say. So A1, there was some confusing language around A1 because originally it said fewer than 10 employees located in New York. So they're or working on New York business. So there became a conversation of, well, what does it mean? Do you know, I have I only have two or three people that are licensed in New York. Does that mean I'm exempt? Does that mean I'm not? So they've removed that language and they've upped the count to 20. So now it's very clear. Fewer than 20 employees qualifies for an A1 limited exemption. There was some clarification that happened on A2 as well. Uh, less than 5 million in gross annual revenue in this state. So they make it pretty clear. If you're making 5 million off of New York business, A2 is a good limited exemption claim for you. And A3, they're proposing a change from 10 million in year in total assets to 15 million in total assets. So that's a pretty clear change too. I think the bottom line with, with these limited exemption changes is we're likely going to see more agencies that qualify for limited exemption than we had in the past. Although some might be claiming A3 instead of A1, 
Um, but that's a minor change. Now, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but don't get too excited because a lot of the limited exemption things, uh, they're not so limited and not so exempt when you get into the other states and the other regulations and when you get into what the cyber liability carriers want to see from us in order to issue us a policy. So we'll go through that in, in much greater detail. But there is one change that's important in limited exemption. So in the original iteration of this regulation, limited exemption agencies were exempt from multi-factor authentication. So they're dropping that. Um, now, everybody, everybody has to do multi-factor authentication, which in my humble opinion is not a bad thing. I like to see MFA all the places all the time. Um, it's one of our, one of our best frontline defenses against compromises. The rest of the limited exemptions, they still fall in your category. Um, cybersecurity governance, application security, um, oddly enough, even encryption of non-public information, but we'll talk about that in a minute too. So let's get into some of the key sections and changes that happen with these new proposed things. So section two, right out of the bat, you're seeing that class A company. So cybersecurity program is section two. So let's take a minute and talk about what a cybersecurity program is. You know, when you when you watch the Super Bowl and you know, football team wins the Super Bowl, you're like, man, they had a great program this year. Well, what does it mean to have a great program? Well, they had they had playbooks, they had execution of plays, they had they had training, they had you know medical staff, they had exercises. There was an awful lot of detail and a lot of specific things that went into that program. And it's no different here. Within your cybersecurity program, that's all the things that you, you think you're going to do, all the things you want to do, all the things that you executed on, and all the things that you wrote down and said you were going to execute on. So class A companies, um, they, get, they get a little tighter screws here. Uh, class A companies have to do an independent audit, there's that term, of their cybersecurity program at least annually. So at least once a year, those class A companies need to have an unaffiliated third party grading their progress and grading their results. So for the rest of us, um, the important thing here is third parties are along for the ride. So um, I happen to be a third party. Um, we do IT services for insurance agencies. So not only does that insurance agency have to have their own cybersecurity program, yeah, IT providers, third party providers, um, the resource pros, the patches of the world, the outsourcing wave, those guys also, also have to have a cybersecurity program. And if New York comes knocking, uh, we have to aid in that process. Um, your IT companies, um, your your third party vendors, they have to to aid in that process and make those programs, those policies and procedures available for inspection for the state of New York. Now, all this, at least annually, has to be reviewed and signed off by the senior governing body. See, right out of the gate, we're getting that new definition. So this is not just one person saying we're good. The senior governing body has to review the cybersecurity policies, the cybersecurity program, and how all that works together. So the cybersecurity policy, these are the very specific written things that you say you're going to do. So in a lot of regulations, that's very ambiguous. Well, what, what do we write down? What's the minimum set of policies we need? New York did a very good job of laying that out for us. New York provides very specific guidelines at bare minimum. And they've added a couple for these proposed changes. Security awareness and training, they've added a requirement for a policy for that. And vulnerability management. We're gonna talk about what vulnerability management means in greater detail um, just just a bit in just a bit. 
but those have been added to the baseline bare minimum set of policies that we need within our cybersecurity program. So section four is our first limited exemption section, uh, cybersecurity governance. Now this section used to be called chief information security officer. So you see the trend there, we're going away from the person to the concept of, of all in skin in the game, cybersecurity governance. Now, the language here is very interesting. Um, again, it's limited exemption, but I want you to pay attention because you're getting a glimpse of the future here. The CISO must have adequate authority to ensure cybersecurity risks are properly managed. That means the ability to direct sufficient resources. We're not just talking about people talking about money. So essentially what this is saying is, is within the concept of cybersecurity governance, um, the person or persons in charge of security, they have to have the tools, they have to have the funding to get the job done. That's a mandate. So that's important. So within your cybersecurity governance, um, one of the things they're looking for now or plans for remediating material inadequacies. So within our risk assessments, when we perform our risk assessments, we always find things that, that could do with some improvement that, um, that are either understaffed, underserved, or underfunded. So within, within these risk assessments and within our program, we have to identify these things and we have to put them down on paper. You know, what are we gonna hit first quarter? What are we gonna hit third quarter? What are we going to hit next year? New York's not saying that we have a deadline, but New York is saying that we need to have a plan. So if a risk assessment identifies a lapse or a gap, uh, we have to be able to write it down and say, we're going to address that in this quarter, at this time, at this month. We, we, have, we have some flexibility there, but we have to be able to, to say, we're going to address that. We have the plan. The other piece of language that they've added is within cybersecurity governance, you have to have the sufficient expertise and knowledge or be advised by people with expertise and knowledge. So um, we can't have the blind leading the blind. Uh, we can't have somebody who just inherited the job. Um, you got to have the expertise to pull it off. You have to, you have to have a background in security. You have to know these things. But again, you can use a third party for this. It doesn't mean you have to hire security staff or IT staff. You can contract with a company to, to advise or consult. Section five, vulnerability management. So they point out two things in vulnerability management. And I still see a lot of confusion about what those mean. So... Vulnerability management often means penetration testing, but it can also mean vulnerability scanning. Um, you see this language in NAIC's model law. You see it in New York's regulation. And these are two fundamentally different things with two fundamental goals. So penetration testing, it's a point in time thing. It's a stress test. It is an actual attempt to compromise your security. This is basically paying a hacker to hack your network. So it's usually performed by somebody external from the company because it's not a true test of your security if you're the guy who wrote the security. Um, you've got a lot of insight that generally, you know, a hacker right off the street isn't going to have. So it's not a, not a good and clear, concise test. So these things, they're time intensive, they're labor intensive. You have to, you have to build a dossier, you have to build a plan, then you have to execute on the plan. Penetration tests cost a lot of money. On the on the small side, fifteen thousand dollars is not unreasonable. A lot of times, that's a deal to get a penetration test. Now, vulnerability scanning, on the other hand, this is far more affordable. Um, it tends to happen on a schedule, in real time, an automated process, scanning systems, scanning software packages for known vulnerabilities. So we're not talking about an actual attempt to compromise. We're talking about 
did we leave any windows open? Did we leave any doors unlocked? Um, does Adobe Reader have a have a known vulnerability that gets patched in a new version? Stuff like that. Usually you'll see like a low, medium, and high classification. It's not uncommon for a vulnerability scanner to come back with, with hundreds or thousands of things. Because you think about it, if you're scanning 153 workstations and all of them have that same Adobe Reader error or misconfiguration or missing an update, you're going to get 153 dings. That one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, they... You know, they they all hit this vulnerability thing. So when you get a vulnerability report for the very first time, it it hurts. It really hurts your feelings because you think you're doing a great job. And then somebody slams this giant report on your desk and you're like, what is going on? So that's vulnerability scanning. Um, it is in the weeds. It is in the details, uh, but it is becoming more and more necessary. So this is a limited exemption section. Uh, but NAIC model law, um, California, other other data privacy regulations, other data privacy guidelines, they really want to see, at the very least, one or the other, either penetration testing at minimum annually or ongoing and continuous vulnerability scanning. If I have to choose between the two from a budgeting perspective, I'm going to choose vulnerability management every time. There's more bang for the buck. Um, once you get your vulnerabilities right, once you get your policies and procedures in place, once you're starting to run out of things to do and you're really feeling like I got a good security program going on here, I'm pretty confident that I would withstand any kind of attack. Now's the time to pay that penetration test. Now's the time to get those people in there and and really stress test the system at that point you will get your money's worth guaranteed so as far as new york's concerned uh, limited exemption you kind of get a pass on this but um for the for the larger agencies they want penetration testing at least annually and done by an independent party they also want ad automated scans that also include a manual review of those scans. And that's typically what we do. We'll run a vulnerability scan. Um, and, and then, you know, we have a human being look at these things because not all vulnerabilities are created equally. And even when you're talking about high, medium, and low, all high vulnerabilities are not created equally. So that's where they want that manual review because the human, the cybersecurity expert can take a look at these things and of the of the six critical high vulnerabilities, one, two, and three, we hit those, we're in a relatively good space, we hit the other ones. So the human can kind of prioritize, which is why they're stressing the manual review. They're also pointing out um, that you need to have a monitoring process in place. And this is this is good because vulnerability scanning changes every day. The vulnerabilities I have right now might be different tomorrow. You know, Windows is going to do some updates. My third-party patching software is going to do some patching. Um, but there might be some new exploits discovered. Uh, so my, my exposure score today might be different than the one tomorrow. Um, I did see a question just come in from Frank. Uh, to be clear, the limited exemption category is not required to have penetration testing or monitoring. Yes, that is true. Limited exemption means that you don't have to do this. But in AIC model law, so those other 21 states, they're going to want to see, at the very least, some kind of vulnerability management going on. Um, your cyber liability carriers, when you go up for renewal, they're going to be asking these questions. Do you have a process for managing CVE-based vulnerabilities? They will be asking this question. So while, while New York gives you a pass, um, you're definitely going to want to have a plan to put something like this in place. I would say start with the vulnerability management. Um, worry about the penetration testing later. The beauty of those things is that they tend to get automated and less expensive 
progressive over time. So hopefully by the time that this is a, a very, very common requirement, maybe the bone maybe the penetration test won't cost quite so much. That's that's the hope at least. So I have another question here on limited exemption. Can you clarify the number of employees? Uh, right now it's 10. Uh, the, the proposed change is going to be 20. So um, 20 or more, you don't get to take the A1 exemption. You still might qualify for A2 or A3 based on your revenue in New York, based on your overall total of assets. Um, you might still qualify for A2 and A3. Everybody still awake? All right, section seven, access privileges and management. Um, a lot of new language here. So we'll notice a trend as we read through this. The access that a user should have is limited, necessary to perform the user's job necessary to perform the user's job only when performing functions requiring the use of um, and of course removing and disabling accounts that are no longer necessary so what new york's trying to do here is reduce your threat pro profile so um you know i'm an executive in the company um by rights i should have access to all the things right yeah i should have access to to what's going on over in sales and what's going on over in marketing and what's going on over in agency consult. I should have access to all those things. They're mine, right? Well, what the regulation says is if that's not my day job, I should stay out of it. So I don't have a role in agency consulting. I shouldn't be in there. So in the insurance agency, you know, you've, you've got your benefits department, you've got your commercial lines, you've got your commercial personal lines, you might have agriculture. Um, essentially, what they're saying here is if your role is personal lines, you shouldn't necessarily have access to commercial lines files unless it's necessary to do your job and vice versa. Commercial lines, same thing. They shouldn't necessarily have access to, to personal lines files. So we see separations like this happen in our in our file structures, our shared files, our our SharePoint, our Citrix share file, stuff like that. So um, I want to take this opportunity to go back to that that privileged account concept. So if you're walking around with local admin rights, if you're walking around with global admin rights to your Microsoft 365 environment, um, You've now really gone astray of the New York regulations because those are not necessary to perform your day job. They're not they're they're not necessary all the time. Section right section three right there. Only when performing functions require the use case. So, as a security guy, um, I can make material changes to our environment. So. I have two accounts. I have my primary daily driver. It's the account I use every day. I work in Teams. I work in our systems. I send and receive emails with clients and prospects and stuff like that. Um, that account cannot make any changes. I can't install software on my computer. I can't add new users to our Microsoft 365 environment. I have an, a completely different account to do that type of work only when performing those functions. So if I were to add a new user to our environment, I have to log in as a completely different account with completely different password and multi-factor authentication, make that change, and then close the door. The reason why we do it that way is if I click on something in my email that I should not have clicked on, I'm not damaging the company. I'm only damaging me. So question just came in. Who should have that super user access? Um, well, ultimately, it depends on who's doing the job. The general rule of thumb, as few people as possible. Um, so only those people that are that are necessary. Uh, where Where is the line? Where What line do you draw? 
That's an excellent question. Um, a lot of times it depends on the organization's size. A lot of the times it depends on the structure. You know, you might have three or four locations that function almost independently of one another. So, you know, agency A and B and C, they uh, joined forces over the years, but they still, you know, agency A still sets up their own users and B sets up their own users. Um, so you might have a situation where you've got multiple people that have those, those super admin, those local admin, um, those global admin controls. But you might only have one. So it's going to vary um, agency by agency, company by company. This is one of those things you discover in the risk assessment when you start looking at, at your permissions and who's got access to what. That's where you start making those things. Um, there's a term we use in, in security um, called role-based access. So rather than determining Bob has access, Sally has access, Susan has access, we look at the role. If the role is operations manager, if the role is team lead, we might say the role justifies that we create those extra accounts or the role justifies that we add those extra permissions. That way we have an automated process. If Sally becomes a manager, bam, we stick her into that role. She's got the rights related to the role. Makes it a lot easier when we're reviewing our policies and procedures and, and making sure that what we actually have aligns with those policies. It's a lot easier to look at the role and who holds the role than it is to look at the granular details of every account. So that's typically the, the, better, the better way to do it by way of role. So section seven, access privileges and management. This, is con this continues on. Class A, um, they, get, they get some extra stuff. Now, this once again is, is kind of a glimpse into the future here. So class A has to monitor that privileged access activity, privileged access management solutions, an automated method of blocking commonly used passwords for all accounts. So let's look at that point number one, privileged access management. So essentially what they're saying here is if you have a privileged account, everything you do is going to have to be logged. Now, this is class A companies, but this is this is true of a lot of the regulations that we're seeing. Um, NAIC model law makes reference to this. We're seeing a lot of cyber liability carriers hone in on this. The general rule of thumb is if you have a privileged account, everything that thing does needs to be scrutinized. This is how we're this is how we're pushing off um, our our log analytics, how we're looking at security profiles how we're identifying significant risks. You know, somebody attempts to compromise Susan's password. Yeah, maybe we're concerned, but we're not ringing the alarms. If somebody's trying to compromise that global admin account, that privileged access account, we're ringing the bells, we're, we're responding. So that's how you, that's how you kind of dial your response there. Um, I have one more question coming in about the limited exemptions. So do A1, A2, and A3, do they all have to apply or do just one? And that's an excellent question. Um, it's, um, they don't all have to apply. You can file limited exemption based on any of those three. It doesn't have to be all. So if you've got over 20 users, 20 employees, but you don't have $15 million in assets, you can file that A3 exemption and, and still meet the goal. So section nine, that risk assessment. Um, not a whole lot here has changed. They added a little bit of clarification. Um, so the risk assessment needs to happen at least annually or whenever there's a change in business or technology. So um, if you've just made a shift from AMS 360 to Epic or vice versa, if you've just made a shift from Google Workplace to Microsoft 365, 
that's a significant change in technology and it might warrant a risk assessment. If you've just acquired an agency, that might that might trigger a risk assessment. So class A companies, they get a little, little bit extra here. Every three years, they must use external experts to use to do their risk assessments. So even if they are fully staffed in their security department, every three years, they still have to have that fresh set of eyes that that is beholden to no one. Um, just to make sure they're doing they're doing all the right things. So, got another question here. Uh, what is your take on the actual expected frequency of the term periodic? So, good question. So, each covered entity shall conduct a periodic risk assessment. General rule of thumb, and again, I'm not a lawyer. But general rule of thumb, once a year. So if you don't have any significant changes in your business, if you haven't made any huge leaps and bounds in your technology, um, minimum at least once a year. That's that's what we tend to do. That's what we tend to see. Um, and every now and then, there's there's enough of a change where it warrants a full scale start to finish risk assessment. A lot of times we just pop the hood and we say, well. We know that this one thing has changed. So let's look at this one thing. So maybe an insurance agency that's Epic based acquired an, an agency that's AMS 360 based. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to look at everything, but we do have to look at the role-based access controls within AMS 360 now, because we've got we've got rights and we've got roles well defined in Epic. Now let's Let's look at our AMS 360. Let's make sure we got some feature parity. Let's make sure it makes a lot of sense. Personal lines is personal lines. Commercial lines is commercial lines. And we get that lined up. But general rule of thumb, uh, if you haven't looked once a year, that's the time to do it. So section 10, cybersecurity personnel and intelligence. Uh, a lot of words here, but the bottom line is you don't have to hire staff. Um, you don't have to have your security people on staff. You can use a third party. Again, we, we go back to the to the other things. They got to be qualified. They got to be competent. They got to be security people. So you can't just hire anybody off the street, uh, but you can use a third party person or a service to get all this stuff done and help you with the things. So section 12, multi-factor authentication. Um, if you were paying attention, you notice I skipped section 11, which is auditing, um, that hasn't changed. So anything that hasn't changed, uh, we've, we've glossed over here. Um, I will provide links for the original regulations um, as we send up the follow-up emails for this webinar. We'll send out the links for the, the original, the proposed. So even the sections that we skipped, You'll still have those reference points, but um, just in the interest of time, we kind of jump over them. So section 12, multi-factor authentication, um, that is no longer limited exemption, which is great. Um, everybody's got to be doing this stuff. So they have made some provisions, except for where reasonably equivalent or more secure compensating controls have been implemented. So they're they're allowing that maybe multi-factor authentication is not is not the top of the food chain. And that's true. Microsoft has done an awful lot of work towards passwordless authentication to just-in-time authentication to situational analysis and AI-based authentication. Of course, you got biometrics, eye scanners, retinal scanners, thumbprints, stuff like that. Um, the regulation does does allow for that stuff. Um, you know, they're, they're really honing in on remote access. Um, that's not just New York. Everybody is, uh, the pandemic brought about some really, really challenging stuff and how we get work done. So the, you know, the regulators are real keen on that, um, and remote access to third-party applications. So those are your cloud-based systems. That's going to be your AMS 360. That's going to be your Epic um, the, and your privileged accounts. 
I mean, that's kind of an obvious one. So let me talk about those third-party applications for a second. Microsoft 365, that whole that whole ecosystem, your SharePoint, your OneDrive, your Teams, um, that's a third-party application or third-party service. Um, Got to have multi-factor authentication on there, hands down. So Apply Systems Epic, um, TAM Online, Hosted TAM, Private Cloud, all those things. So as of the winter 2022 release, uh, Epic does support single sign-on and it does support multi-factor authentication. So now you can get that done. It isn't turned on by default and it isn't implemented by default, but it can be done. Same thing with Vertifor's AMS 360. You can do single sign-on. You can do multi-factor authentication there. So nothing standing in your way for, for checking this box. It's really not hard. And uh, if I'm being honest, by today's standards, Section 12 is pretty weak um, with cyber liability carriers and the questions they're asking on their applications, their renewals. Um, this stuff is, is table stakes now. We're seeing a, a lot more very pointed questions that, that, that make you a little more nervous. This stuff, piece of cake. All the tools are there. Very, very easy to turn on and configure. So section 13, asset management and data retention requirements. Uh, a lot of words there, but not a whole lot of changes. Um, the one thing that they're pointing out is that as we're doing our asset management, you know, our workstations, our laptops, our switches, our routers, you know, all the equipment we use, um, we have to be keeping track of the support expiration dates. So what we've realized over the years is as we've been, you know, keeping uh, keeping track of the data, keeping track of how breaches happen and why breaches happen, uh, there's a common theme that older tech causes breaches. Older switches, unpatched firmware, Windows XP, Windows 7, stuff like that. So we're starting to see a trend towards lifecycle management being a key consideration for those assets. So lifecycle management on the assets, the physical equipment, but I also want to point out the title of this section, data retention requirements. We also need a life cycle on the data. Uh, you know, when you look at what the UK is doing with GDPR and what California is doing with its um, with its consumer rights and things of that nature, essentially what the world is telling us is we don't have the right to keep client information forever. We have we we keep it when it's legally necessary. We keep it when we have a job to do. But other than that we have an obligation to start purging that data from our systems. So that's good. That's good for the consumers. It's good for the clients, but really it's also good for us. So the last thing you want is 22 years worth of email being compromised. So you got an email producer, been working for the company 22 years, clicks on the wrong link. Now some bad actor has access to his entire mailbox and he's got 22 years worth of sent emails. Well, that's 22 years worth of apology letters you got to send out, 22 years worth of identity protection you have to pay for. So you definitely want to reduce the amount of data that any one person has access to. Um, that reduces your threat profile. Um, that reduces the likelihood that a breach is going to be significant. Um, so that's important. Now, some states do have requirements. You know, you have to maintain data for five years, seven years. In accounting, 10 years is a pretty common thing. But uh, I want you to start thinking about the concept of hot and cold storage. So we used to know that as servers and backups, the hot and cold storage. So the hot stuff was the stuff you could get your hands on real quick. And the cold storage was the stuff that we kept offline. It was still there. It was there if we needed it. But if we had to access it, it would take a while. Sometimes it would take a couple of days. Sometimes it would take a week to pull that data out. 
So I want to start start you down that path of of thinking of data in terms of those things. So when you think of an email, you think of a mailbox. You know, I've worked for Kite Tech now for 12 years. There is no reason I should have 12 years of email in my mailbox. Um, I only need just a handful of that data to do my day-to-day -day job. Every now and then I do need to go back and reference something from years ago, but I'm okay with that taking time. If it means that if my email gets compromised, I have to apologize to an awful lot less people. I'll take it all day. So, you know, as you're doing exercises with data retention and, and finding out what those requirements are going to be and, and what that works. Um, two to three years in a mailbox is pretty common. I've seen agencies dial that down to only 90 days worth of email. That's impressive. Um, that requires um, a lot of due diligence and, and really a lot of process and a lot of folks dragging and dropping and attaching those things into your agency management system and doing it with, with really good precision. Because if you're dialing down to, to the 90-day mark, everybody's got to be on their game, dragging and dropping and attaching those emails. So that's great. Um, it's an agency down in Atlanta. Uh, they Obviously, they win awards for their best practices every year. Well, well-deserved. So kudos to those guys. I don't want to I don't want to mention them by name, but if you're listening, you get a thumbs up. Um, got a quick question here about MFA. Does MFA for privileged accounts include local privileged account access? So those are your desktop admin accounts, what we call the local admin account. It does. That's an easy thing to pull off in a cloud environment. Maybe not so much in a server, physical premise environment. You're going to need tools. You're going to need processes, something like Cisco Duo, some other kind of um, radius authentication or something like that. Um, it's doable. It's certainly doable, but it's not, it's not like pushing a button. You can't just, bam, we've protected those accounts. So we definitely, if we can get away with it, we do not want to be one of those privileged accounts. That means there's less work to secure what remains. Uh, but yes, MFA does mean those local privileged accounts. So section 14, monitoring and training. Now, this is likely a limited exemption because New York put the two together because monitoring is really fundamentally different than training. But they put the two together, and, and here we are. In a lot of other regulations, in a lot of other things that we're seeing, cyber liability applications, the two are not put together. The two are separate. So what New York is saying here is that we have to implement controls for monitoring and filtering web traffic, email, blocking uh, malicious content, and they're saying that we have to provide periodic, but at a minimum annual, so at least they've defined periodic here, um, security awareness training that includes social engineering exercises, phishing attempts, trying to trick users into clicking on those emails. So this is limited exemption, but by today's standards, this is pretty weak. This is par for the course. You will not get a cyber liability application that doesn't ask to all your users attend security awareness training. Are you actively testing these things? Are you blocking these things? So this is, I want you to think of this as table stakes because everywhere you go, um, any company you work with, they're going to want to see that you're doing this. And, and not only that, not from a regulation standpoint, this is, this is good practice. The biggest risk any of us have are those frontline employees that are sending and receiving emails that are exchanging. Um, everybody knows that. That's where that's where the bad actors try and get people. The social engineering tax, they are very effective to this day. Um, so definitely, definitely have to be doing this. Uh, got a message here. Shout out to know before. Yes. Um, Eleni, not, not to be confused with our Eleni, 
but Eleni from New York, um, they will pay for it for New York agencies. So that's great. So there's a free resource for you. Uh, no before, very good product. Um, I, again, I'm a security guy, but I like the training. The training that they do, it's very interesting. Um, some of the emails that they put through the system, they're they're quite good. They're quite challenging. I got a whole bunch of security people on my team and every now and then they get caught. So yeah, definitely shout out to know before. So continuing with section 14 monitor and training, um, this is specifically for class A companies, but this is going to give you a glimpse in the future. Class A companies, they're going to need endpoint detection and response, and they're going to need centralized logging of security events and alerts. So Endpoint detection response, sometimes we call it EDR, sometimes we call it MDR, managed detection and response. Uh, XDR is a common term. Um, centralized logging, those are your, what's called SIM or SOC, sometimes we call them SOAR, lots of acronyms on the security field. Essentially what, what centralized logging is, is you've got a server, it's got event logs. You've got a workstation, it's got event logs. You've got a firewall. It's got event logs. Microsoft 365, more event logs. So the more stuff you have, the more piles of event logs you have. So at some point, you've got to suck in all these event logs into one big ball, and it will end up being millions of event logs. So how do we comb through millions of event logs and find the gold? How do we find the needle in a stack of needles? You know, that's where you're going to need a tool like a SIM or a SOC that um, that will comb through those logs on your behalf and raise the flag on the security events. Kind of expensive to pull that off. So not my highest priority. But I do want to draw your attention to endpoint detection and response. We are seeing a lot of cyber liability carriers ask that question. So endpoint detection and response, think of it as uh, an antivirus software with a supercharger. So when antivirus software came along, you know, it was signature based. It knew what to look for. And if it found it, it slapped it down. So over the years, antivirus got a little more intelligent. It could now make decisions on our behalf. So it would see a process running on a, on a computer and it would think to itself, oh, that's new. I've never seen it before. I don't know if it's good or bad. Let's block it just in case. So the antivirus software got a little bit smarter. And these days, the antivirus has gotten smarter still. So the EDRs and the MDRs of the world, it's antivirus that can tell a story. So what I've got on the screen here is um, it's an investigation graph. So something of interest happens on the computer. Files downloaded. In this case, that's exactly what happened. A file was downloaded. We don't know if it's good or bad, but we know it's new and it hasn't happened before. So we're going to take a look. And so the, the EDR goes to work. It, it, in this case, it was a zip file. So it scans the zip file. It scans the contents of the zip file. And, and it sees something it doesn't like. There's a file within the zip file. It might be good, it might be bad, but we're not, we're not going to let it run. So now we know we've got something of interest. Okay, what else has happened since this file got downloaded? What else could have been affected? So that's where the EDR and the investigation comes in. As the EDR can go back in and it can say, well, there were... 429 drivers that were running on this thing. There were 320 services running on this workstation. Let's look at all those. Let's make sure they haven't changed. There were 43 IP addresses on the network when this happened. Let's look at those guys and make sure they haven't changed. So we're, we're really getting big picture here with our threat profile. So that's what an EDR attempts to do. It tells the story, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of a material incident. 
not 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 good not bad just incident worthy of note so um i just got a message from peter here in the chat and they recently went with sentinel one sentinel one um is is an edr very powerful software uh, it does take a little time to implement but very powerful what you see on your screen here is actually microsoft defender for business so and within the Microsoft Business Premium SKU, the $22 per user per month SKU, Microsoft has added a full vulnerability management solution. Microsoft has added a full EDR solution into it. And it, it, does, it does take some tuning and some turning up and getting it working. But yes, far more robust than your typical, than your web roots of the world, your semantics of the world, um, your e-sets of the world. This is... Uh, this is antivirus on a whole new level. So definitely worth looking at this, even though it's limited exemption, this stuff is coming. Um, and it's becoming more and more affordable. They used to cost a fortune. Now it costs as much as what we're used to paying for antivirus. So not a whole compelling reason to get a lesser product when we can, when we can get the good stuff for the same price. So section 15, encryption of non-public information. It's limited exemption, but I got to tell you, by today's standards, this is pretty weak. So, you know, New York wants data to be encrypted in transit and at rest. You know, in transit, you know, think of the emails that you send and receive. That's in transit. Think about when you're, when you're putting client information into a carrier website. That's in transit between you and the carrier website. The external, uh, the, the data at rest. That's the stuff stored on your computer, stored on your server, your downloaded files, your my documents, stuff like that. Um, like I said, by today's standard, it's pretty weak. Um, all the cyber liability carriers, they mandate both. Um, all the other regulations that we see out there, they mandate both. Nobody gets off the hook. So this is definitely something you have to do. But here's the beauty of it. Um, and here's the compelling reason. So if you needed a reason to actually do what's right, here it is. Um, if you lose a laptop that is not encrypted, you have a notification of breach on your hands. You're going to have to do an investigation on what that laptop was, what it contained, user profiles, all the documents, all of the emails that could have been contained in the OST and the cache that was stored on it. You have a lot of work to do. If that thing is encrypted, nothing. We, we lost the laptop and it had nothing on it but a bunch of ones and zeros. So that's a great way to avoid a breach by encrypting all the stuff. These days, it's very easy to do. Windows 10 Pro, Windows 11 Pro, uh, it's baked into the operating system using uh, what's called Microsoft BitLocker. Now, there are some third-party applications. ESET does it. Semantic still does it. Um, but if you've got no other options, the Microsoft BitLocker approach is, is great. And, and then again, we go back to that business premium SKU. So if you've got Microsoft business premium licensing, you do have within your Microsoft 365 tenant a way to report, a way to manage those decryption keys. So if anything goes missing, you can do a report, take a screenshot, and you can prove at the time of loss, here's the recovery key. This thing was encrypted. I don't have, I don't have a data breach. I just have a, la a lost laptop. So very good to get that done. Section 16. Uh, lots of words. Incident response plan and business continuity management. So that's a new title. This used to be just called um, Incident Response Plan. So what New York has found and, and what other regulators have found is that, yeah, yeah, we're going to have breaches. Yeah, we're going to have we're going to have events and we're going to have incidents. But what's most important is how we get back to business. How do we get back to serving the needs of our customers? That's where that business continuity plan comes in. So New York, um, now this is limited exemption. So 
this is for the bigger guys, but this is a good thing to have regardless. Um, what does the plan look like? Um, if you have a material breach, if you have a, a system outage, if you know if something is compromised, you know, how are you going to get that done? How are you going to do the things you need to get done to fix that? But continue your day-to-day -day operations. How are you going to isolate the data? How are you going to isolate the affected users and, and still serve the needs of your customers? That's what New York wants to know. That's what your cyber liability carriers want to know. Uh, because they're on the hook for paying for this thing the whole time it's down. So they want you up. They want you back to work. They want to reduce that exposure. So this is a good thing to have. Um, a lot of paperwork, a lot of process, a lot of table games and understanding the business continuity and what that looks like, but well worth the effort um, to strategize and think about what that happens. Uh, those of you who are based out in Florida, you know the value of a business continuity plan. You know, hurricane comes through, what do you do? How do you keep people working? How do you send them home? What are the tools that they need? What tools aren't they going to have that we need to address? Um, very important things. So section 17, notices to superintendents. So this is where we get into that, um, that first of its kind regulation here is we actually have to go to New York and we have to talk about these things. So a little bit of clarity added here. Um, there was always a question of well, what is it what does it mean to have a cybersecurity event? What does that look like? Well, a cybersecurity event is when an unauthorized user has gained access to a privileged account. So see that? That's why we don't want to be one. We do not want to be a privileged account when we grow up. So um, they continue on, and now they want to see some written acknowledgments. So if you didn't fully comply, they want to know why. They want to know what your remediation plans are. They want to know your timeline for implementation. So that's very important. Notices of explanations and extortion payments. If you've paid a ransomware, they want to know within 24 hours. Usually they'll give you 72 hours, stuff like that. Um, they want to know within 24 hours. So got a quick question here. So if it's a standard account, not a privileged account, is it a cybersecurity event? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we go back to the term material. Um, is what happened material? Is it important? Is, is it large enough of a concern for you to have asked these questions? It might be a cybersecurity event. So business email compromise of, of the president of the company. Yeah, that might be a cybersecurity event, even if that person is not a privileged account. So there's still a little bit of gray area. Um, we still have to think these through, but at the very least we know for a fact, if it's a privileged account, it's an automatic yes. So ha not having privileged accounts doesn't always get you off the hook, but um Definitely worth reducing that threat profile. And section 20 is enforcement. And then again, this is another part of the first of its kind regulation is they baked the enforcement right in. So the first thing right out of the gate, they say the commission of a single act shall constitute a violation. So it's a pass or fail kind of thing. We either do it right or we're doing it wrong. But they go on to say, how they're going to enforce and the types of things that they're going to take into account, which is really important. So they're going to look at the good faith of the entity. Did you try? Um, were you making really good attempts at cybersecurity and it just, it was unfortunate? Um, whether the violations resulted from conduct that was intentional and deliberate, uh, they're going to, they're going to take a look at that as well. Another interesting thing that they point out, um, to the extent, if any, to which the senior governing body played a part. So they're going to look at the senior governing body and they're going to look at the decisions made. If the senior governing body 
uh, didn't give the chief information officer adequate tools and, and adequate resources to do the job, uh, the fines might be larger. So I haven't seen a whole lot of fines come across the board. Um, but one, one that was interesting, one fine was levied at an insurance carrier uh, because the state of New York felt that they could have done better. So they did all the things, but I guess, I guess they, you know, I guess they kind of boilerplated it, kind of templated it, um, didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. And New York came back and said, yeah, I'm not impressed. Here's a fine, which is interesting, but also a little bit scary. Um, so definitely, definitely think about enforcement and think about, again, we go back to that good faith. You know, they, they want to see agencies taking this seriously. They want to see entities, you know, really putting in the work to, to do this right and to do it well. And the last piece, section 21, is the effective date. That's the big question. Like, when is all this stuff going to happen? And it's, it's all over the board. Some's 30 days, some's 18 months, some are two years. But by and large... Um, when these new regulations get adopted and, and put out there, you're going to have 180 days to start complying. So um, 180 days doesn't seem like a lot of time, but it it is a, enough to get it done. If, if you're already in compliance and you're already doing a good job with your 23 MRC regulations, 180 days to implement this stuff, piece of cake, no problem. Even if you've got some material things that you have to address with your current regulations, you're still pretty fine to hit the 180-day uh, mark. So next steps. So what now? Well, now I'm going to give you some homework. So step one, don't wait. Start now. Let's just assume that these regulations, they're going to get they're going to get approved. We're going to have that target. We're 180 days. We're going to have to start making changes. Don't wait. Go ahead and start now. I can I can tell you, I can promise you, these things are coming. So review the proposed changes with your lawyer, you know, the actual language and letter of the law, um, and with your senior governing body. See what I did there? So not just a person. Get it on the calendar for the senior governing body to really start taking a look at this stuff. The things you want to be looking at is, do you qualify for limited exemption? Um, you know, if so, which one? What other state regulations are going to apply? NAIC has been adopted by 21 states, so it would be a shame to put in all this work for New York and then miss the mark on Virginia or miss the mark in South Carolina or Michigan. So take a look at it bigger picture and let's develop a good cybersecurity program that performs well for all the regulations that are out there today so once we understand what we need what we need to do meet with the IT team and let's figure out how to do it um, step 1 of course is performing a gap analysis what do you have what do you need what's right what's wrong what's missing and then develop a plan for implementation so you know, from that right, wrong, and missing, you're going to come up with some high priorities, some medium, some low priority stuff. Um, you might find some stuff that might not make it into this year's budget, and you want to tackle that in 2024. Yeah, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but generally that's okay as long as you have the plan and and you've you've made good effort and you're you're doing the things. You can't you can't do nothing. That's not acceptable. But if you're doing things, but you know that there are better tools that you want to afford, as long as you can roadmap that out and put a plan in place, that's perfectly fine. But don't wait. So how could a company like Kite Tech help? Well, for, for our contract clients, for our managed service clients, um, you're going to be covered. Uh, but again, you make you compliant, we help. So rest assured, we'll be knocking on your door. We'll be scheduling some meetings. We're going to be talking about this stuff, um, but we're going to get you done. When we put together our um, our security requirements and our security contracts for our clients, we put in the concept of evergreen. We knew that these changes were coming. We knew that the regulations were going to change, and we knew we'd have to respond. 
So that's what we're doing. That's what we're putting the plans together for. Now for the rest of you, um, I don't know you, so I don't know where you are on this journey. So I'd like to introduce myself. I'd like to introduce Kite Tech. Um, we're well-versed in insurance regulations. So if you have any questions, definitely reach out. Um, we do offer some standalone risk assessments. We do offer some Microsoft 365 assessments. We've got a lot of deep expertise in Microsoft 365. So you know, if you're not on that business premium license, if you're on business standard or something like that, you know, we can help get you to business premium. We can help you implement those tools that come along with it. Business premium includes an awful lot of the tools that are needed to make a lot of this stuff a breeze. Um, we love to work with other IT companies. So if you've got internal staff, if you've got, you know, IT companies that you love working with already, uh, we're just here to help. Um, you know, for the rest of you, keep attending our webinars. We talk about this kind of stuff all the time. We'll be at NetView. Uh, we'll be at AppliedNet. We'll be talking about regulations. We'll be talking about security best practices. Um, that's really, that's our mission in life is, is to get the word out, to deliver good security, you know, just to make sure that everything, everything is working as well as it can be. So we did run a little long, but I, I got all the questions in there. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in early on in the process. I think I hit most of them. So Lisa asked, what's required for non-resident New York licenses and where do we send the required information? So resident and non-resident, no distinction. You're a covered entity, you gotta do something. So where do you send the required information? That gets done in the DFS portal. So um, along with this webinar wrap up, we're gonna be sending links to the DFS portal. So you'll have those as well. Uh, Richard asked, what's the best way to obtain compliance validation from our vendor partners? That's that third-party risk assessment. So um, within that DFS portal, um, you'll, you'll send a link. Um, New York's got some, some boilerplate, some templated policies specifically for third-party service providers. Feel free to take one of those and, and modify it and tweak it to your very specific needs. And, and then start down that path. Make a list of your, of your vendors, what they have access to, whether or not they are um, needing that extra scrutiny, and go from there. Cheryl asks, is centralized logging of all the endpoints becoming a requirement? Um, yes. Yes, it is. So still kind of limited exemption in Class A from a New York perspective. But yeah, all over the place, I'm seeing more and more um, logging and having having a lengthier retention of logs, 30 days, 90 days, sometimes a year. Um, yes, centralized logging is in the not too distant future. Uh, I've got another question from Carrie here. Um, there are a lot of third-party risk vendor management platforms. Um, oh, sorry, not a question, a comment. So. Uh, Carrie uses third-party trust, so that's a platform. Um, they love it. Definitely worth checking that out. Um, and you and she's right. There are a lot of lot of platforms, um, along with the links to the DFS portal. Um, within DFS, New York has a link to um, yet, yet another portal that's got a lot of great tools for small businesses. Um, they're all kind of pre-vetted by New York. You're going to find a lot of good information in there to get you started as well. So another question, Deandra asks, what are the proposed upcoming changes? How does Kite Tech prepare? Um, I think we did a good job. And hopefully we did a good job answering that. Um, if not, let me know. <laughs> uh, Lisa asked, does it make a difference if our agency is owned by a financial institution? It might. Um, there are likely some other regulations that come in. FINRA, SIPC come to mind. Um, I did have another question about here saying uh, from Jane, she's got a few people in a financial services department. Does the whole agency have to 
have to apply with um, FINRA? Um, that's an excellent question. You kind of want to start with your lawyers in that in that regard. Um, you know, what are you legally obligated to do? But I think the reality is that if you're bank owned, if you're owned by a financial institution, I think, yes, I think you're going to have to do a little bit extra. So Renee asked about um, filing for licensed CSRs that fall under the exemption. Now, that's, that's a rare case where exemption actually does mean exemption. They still have to file, but within the DFS portal, there is an exemption that you can, play, you can claim. If you're a licensed agent and you either are not practicing at all or you work for a covered entity that is in full compliance, these are going to be your licensed account managers and CSRs they can file for that exemption um, and file under your flag. Of course, they're going to ask, well, who's the covered entity that's representing you? But yes, those guys, they don't have to develop their own policies and procedures and all that stuff. They can run with yours. So Christian um, was asking for a recap of the requirements for small agencies under five people. Well, New York's only making that limited exemption A1 for under 20. So if you're under five, you're you're under that 20, and that's going to be your mark. It's going to be that limited exemption mark. So Julie says, we're not New York-based, but we have clients that are in New York. Does that apply to us? Yes. Um, if you have that New York non-resident producer license, you are considered a covered entity. Um, Kathleen was asking about MFA with Epic. Winter 2022, that's the goal. If you're on winter 2022, and by now I think everybody is, um, they, they did the upgrades data center by data center, but I think everybody is on winter 2022 by now. Um, you do have that option, but you do have to reach out to support to get it all turned on and configured. Um, John said, I often have wondered about the definition of material. Um, John, you are the reason I put that into the webinar. So thank you for that excellent question. Um, material is one of the most curious terms in the insurance language because it's it's always subject to that interpretation. So uh, Timothy asked what's required for MFA. It is limited exemption. I don't want you to think of it that way. MFA all the time, no exceptions. Uh, Jane, uh, Jane, we talked about her FINRA question. Uh, Liana asks, are there any other states with similar and parallel upcoming regulations? Yes. Um, NAIC model law has got at least 21 of them. And lots of other states are either developing in line with NAIC or have plans to adopt it. Some states, I guess because they wanted to be unique, they did modify the requirements. But more often than not, they only require they only modify the re reporting timelines. So that NAIC data security law is going to be a critical thing. Um, that's your South Carolina. That's your that's your Michigan. Your Virginia. A lot of states are piling on there, which is a good thing because it gives us it gives us one north star in which to navigate from. So Donna, same question. And Leanna had a question. Is there a website to access that gives a user-friendly summary of lists and regulations? Um, yes. You will find that in the cybersecurity resources of, of New York's DFS. And we're going to send those links with the wrap-up. So Frank asks, well, more question. It's, it's our understanding that licensed agents do not need to file an exemption if operating under the hospice of a covered entity. They do need to file the exemption, but it doesn't. Um, I think there was a minor change somewhere along, somewhere along the route that said once you file the exemption, you don't have to file exemption every single year. So, so when you have limited exemption, um, you have to file that annual compliance. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer. But I'm fairly certain that if you're filing an exemption status, you don't have to refile unless something changes. Uh, but yes, there is that mechanism that um, that allows for those licensed CSRs for those 
for those non-resident producers that work for covered entities to file that exemption. Worst case scenario, you spend three or four minutes of time doing it, no harm, no foul. I've, I've not seen any fines levied at anybody who was exempt and then got fined for not claiming they were exempt. But when it comes to regulators, um, I like to play nice guy whenever I can. Uh, Kevin asked, does Kitech offer a service to review our current 23 MYCRR documents? Uh, we do. So we have a full technical consulting arm. We have a full cybersecurity arm. Um, we love to help with this kind of stuff. You know, we can we can look at the policies and procedures. We can dive further in. We can look at the Microsoft 365 stuff. Typically, it it starts with kind of a meet and greet, so we can talk about you know what you have, uh, what you know your gaps are, what you think your gaps are, and and then we can devise some some specific scopes of work. Like maybe you know Epic is fine, but maybe you have some questions in Microsoft 365 or or even maybe you want to look at your current set of tools and see what you what you're double paying for. We see this a lot with spam filters and stuff like that where you've got one in Microsoft with business premium and yet you're paying double for yet another for a Barracuda or something like that. Um, so we do we do a lot of of analysis that way as well. Always happy to help. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Jason, for kind of bringing us that information today. I think that covered most of the questions I'm seeing here. Um, thanks to everybody yep. who, who participated and put in questions in real time and in advance. That really uh, kind of goes a long way in helping us to shape the content, make sure it's kind of meeting some of the questions that we're seeing out there in the industry. So, yeah. Yeah. That. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Those were those were excellent questions. Um, I know this stuff is super dense. It's 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 a pain. It's not exciting in any way, shape, or form. So, I love the questions. It lets me know people are taking this seriously. They're they're keen on getting it done. That that makes us feel really good. So, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Jason, for kind of going through some of the some of the detailed pieces there. Um, you guys can see on the screen here if you if you want to get in touch and learn a little bit more about specific services, security services, kind of like we talked about today, or really any other offerings, um, specifically in the, in the agency consulting side of things or beyond, um, here's some ways to get in touch with us. You can email us, engage at Kite Technology Group, uh, visit our website. There's quite a few ways you can get in touch, calling or fill out a form there. Um, definitely don't be a stranger. If you have any of these questions, uh, we're more than happy to take a, a quick look or have a conversation to explore how we can help. So um, thank you again, Jason, for presenting. You guys will probably get a recording of this and put it on the YouTube channel within the next week or so. So feel free to share that out if you found some information helpful for you or other people within your agency. Um, and again, also there'll be a brief survey when the webinar here closes. We'd love to just hear your thoughts on content, some ideas for future webinars, and uh, just, yeah, just let us know how we did today. We really would appreciate that. So- And please don't beat me up for going long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's just too much to cover. There's a lot of detail here. So thanks for breaking it down, Jason. And thanks. No everybody. problem. We'll see you guys around later. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.